This happened a few years ago, while I was working as a park ranger at Nickerson State Park. If you've ever been, you'll know it's a pretty idyllic spot, nestled right in the curve of Cape Cod's arm. Picture postcard stuff. We're talking lovely little kettle ponds, woods thick with pine and oak trees. Just the sort of place you'd think would be calm, serene, and safe. But boy, do I have a tale about a night that was anything but ordinary. As a park ranger, you get to love the park, like it's a part of you almost. You learn every trail, every curve, every hidden spot where the critters like to hide during the hot afternoons. Now, as you may imagine, a decent chunk of my job involved routine tasks. You check trails, mend fences, make sure tourists don't get lost, occasionally break up a rowdy party or two. I'd typically start by checking on the trails, looking for any downed trees or damage that happened overnight. I'd walk those trails so many times I could do it with my eyes closed. On that particular day, everything seemed fine during the day, not a thing out of place. As dusk settled in, I was on my usual rounds, patrolling the campgrounds, reassuring some of the campers who heard something strange in the woods. Usually it turns out to be just a raccoon or possum or some other creature. Foxes have a scream that sounds like a dying woman. People from the city don't know that and they can get pretty spooked. I just dealt with a group of teenagers who thought it could be fun to feed the raccoons. After dispersing them, I started towards one of the more isolated loops, furthest from the park entrance. Most nights, it's the most peaceful part of the whole place with its own little kettle pond. I personally loved it, especially at night, though I get how the isolation could put someone on edge. It was there the incident began. As I was walking, I became aware of a smell that I can only describe as putrid. It was musty like rotting wood, but also curiously acrid, almost sour. It was a thick scent that seemed to hang in the air, heavy and almost, I don't know, sticky. Instantly, my gut churned. There was definitely something wrong here. I've always trusted my instincts out there in the wilderness. They've kept me safe more times than I can count. The rustling leaves, usually harmonious and comforting, began to sound threatening. A crack of a twig made me jump, though normally I would have dismissed it as a deer or a squirrel traipsing through the underbrush. The night suddenly felt extraordinarily dark, swallowing up the beam of my flashlight as I continued to tread forward, ignoring the sinking feeling in my stomach. Then I heard a noise. It began as a low, guttural grunt, resonating deep into the quiet forest around me. It came from somewhere off the path, but I couldn't find its source. I stood frozen, trying to make sense of what animal out here could produce such a sound. Sound travels strangely in the woods at night. It can make the smallest animal sound like a lumbering bear if it's quiet enough. But there was something about this noise that didn't sit right with me. A shiver curved down my spine and for the first time in my career, I felt a pang of real fear. I radioed bass, but no one was answering which was strange in and of itself, given there's always someone on hand for emergencies. I knew I was on my own in that moment. Swallowing my fear, I pushed onward, toward the weird, grating sound. Suddenly, the dense atmosphere broke with a sharp, piercing screech. It echoed with a fury I'd never heard before. It was something between a yell and a deep, resonant growl. The raw power of it reverberated through my bones. I felt then I was in danger, it was unlike anything I'd encountered in my years in the woods. There was a quick succession of knocks against a tree nearby. I stepped closer, my hand shaky on the flashlight, as I cast its beam into the haunting darkness. And that's when I saw it, 16 years in the park, and never once had I seen or heard anything like it. This creature was massive, almost nine feet tall if I had to guess. It was hard to make out exactly in the dim lighting, but the outline was clear as day. A hulking figure, broad and muscular, stood against the backdrop of the night sky, the hard slope of a prominent forehead, heavy jaw, jutting chin and a pair of deep-set eyes that gleamed with an unsettling intelligence. And then there was the smell. The unmistakable offensive odor I'd encountered earlier was now stronger. It was inescapable, nauseating. As for the creature itself, I could see hair, lots of it dark brown, nearing on black. I it was matted down in some places and smoother in others. 
A shiver of realization went down my spine when I saw its ape-like face. My mind raced, grappling with the knowledge that stories I dismissed as myths could be something more. Terrified but hardly daring to move, I was caught between fear and fascination. But my focus was broken as my radio crackled to life. The raspy voice of my co-worker filled the night. Startled, the creature huffed before it turned and disappeared into the brush with a few lengthy strides. I stood petrified with my heart beating out a terrified rhythm against my ribs. Finally, I responded to the radio, trying to calm my voice, and told them I'd be back shortly. But what could I tell them? Who'd believe me? The rest of the night was a blur, or maybe a nightmare, who knows? Making my way back, I reported no unusual incidents, logged out, and returned home. I lay in bed, the haunting image of the creature lingering in my mind. Sleep was a foreign thought. In the days that followed, I continued my rounds, half hoping and half dreading seeing the creature again. But the creature, or what some might call a Sasquatch, never made another appearance. I hoped maybe he was simply passing through, but the fear lingered. Perhaps, I thought, there were dark corners of this beautiful world, unknown and unexplored that are home to such magnificent yet terrifying creatures. And for all others wandering the wilds, remember, there's more mystery in the world than what meets our eyes. I've been a fisherman in Maine all my life, so believe me when I tell you that I know the sea out here in intricate detail. I could navigate through the trickiest inlets in pitch darkness, all the tide information stored away in my memory. So when my engine gave out a few miles from shore, in the middle of a beautiful summer's day, I was sure I'd managed to figure something out. It started out a day like any other, salty breeze in my hair, the rhythm of the waves, and the quiet creaking of the old sea mistress, a name bestowed with irony upon my shoddy little boat. She'd seen rougher waters, but she was a stubborn old gal who never once left me stranded, until that day, of course. Cursing my rotten luck, I set to work on the engine, tools clanging against the hull. The sea mistress this day seemed to have a mind of her own. With the sun beating down and my frustration mounting, I realized it was going to be a long haul. Even though I knew I was a couple of miles away from the shore and surrounded by open sea, I wasn't overly concerned. Coming prepared was second nature to me but waiting around for the engine to cool down was not in my character either. I was floating towards a little uninhabited island, and if I timed it right, I figured I could beach the boat there and sort things out. The current was taking me straight to it. If nothing else, I knew this was a decently well-traveled area, and odds were that I would be spotted if I couldn't get the engine running again. I decided to wait for both myself and the engine to cool off. I tied her down on shore and decided to take myself for a walk around the island before getting back to work. The quietness that welcomed me on the island wasn't unusual. There weren't many animals on these islands. They were pretty much empty. The undergrowth crunched beneath my boots as I made my way through the dense forest cover. I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that something was off about this place. The air seemed heavy and carried a feeling of unexplainable dread. Now I'm not a superstitious man. But when you're alone on an island and stranded, sometimes your mind plays tricks on you. I was just about to head back and start work on my engine again when out of nowhere, a rotten stench hit my nostrils. The smell was overwhelming, a mix of stale blood and rancid meat. It was worse than any chum bucket I had ever smelled. This stench spoke of death, and more than that, of something deeply unnatural. As I turned a small bend by the dense undergrowth, a shiver ran through me, and then something truly horrifying came into my sights. I could see a grotesque figure standing, half lit by the dying sun. It looked like a giant elk at first. Odd, I thought that it was on this little island, but elk are decent swimmers so it's not impossible. But then I saw its face, and I knew it was no natural creature of the earth. The animal itself stood about six foot tall at the shoulder. Its body was a horrid sight. It was like a decaying corpse, like someone had cruelty animated some long-deceased roadkill and let it walk the earth. Its flesh looked as though it was dying, 
peeling and rotting from its skeletal frame. I could see the exposed bone underneath, and yet, the creature was still up and walking. Its limbs were long and spindly. They didn't look like they could support its frame. When it walked, it was wobbly, like the creature was drunk or dying. I thought maybe it was sick, that it had some disease and needed to be put down. But then it turned and I saw its face. There was no skin, no muscle, no flesh, just bone. The whole head was just a skull. There was fur elsewhere on its body, but it seemed to be peeling off. The creature had no eyes, just the two empty sockets. There was no way this thing was alive. It had to be some kind of spirit or supernatural being. The air around me seemed to be sucked away as I struggled to breathe. I don't think I can accurately explain my shock. I was at a loss, mentally cursing myself for coming here. I would have been safer stranded at sea. If the creature saw me, it didn't acknowledge me. I didn't see any point in getting its attention, so I waited quietly for it to pass by, and I slipped away, heading back to the shore. It either didn't notice me, or it did, and it didn't care. Sure, I was curious, but I wasn't about to stick around and look for answers. Finding my way back to Sea Mistress, I felt waves of relief wash over me. At least here in the middle of the sea, I was safe from that creature. Unless, of course, it could swim, I managed to finally coax the engine back to life after some work and made my way back to the mainland. I cannot tell you how relieved I was to be on land. I tried unsuccessfully to convince myself that the creature wasn't real. It was just some strange part of my imagination, a hallucination from the long day on the water and the stress of the failed engine. But I knew better. Deep down, I knew better. I don't like to think about it too often. But there are creatures out there in our world that you can't find in the encyclopedia books. I don't know what that thing was, where it came from, or what it was doing out there. Maybe I don't want to know, but what I do know is that it was real. Road trips have always been our preferred mode of travel, something my wife and I had started when we were younger. And let me tell you, we've seen and experienced some pretty wild things on our trips, but nothing more unsettling than one night we spent in a bed and breakfast in rural Louisiana. We were headed south, quite eager to escape the frigidity of Minnesota winter and to bask in the warmth of the southern sun for a time. There is a freewheeling sense of adventure in hitting the road without a clear plan, and Louisiana, with its blend of vibrant traditions and haunting American history, seemed as good a destination as any. Our bed and breakfast was surprisingly quaint considering the bustling city around us. We managed to find this little place nestled amongst towering cypress trees, all draped in Spanish moss. It was lovely. The place had a certain antebellum charm, porch swings, gingerbread trim, and these tall white columns framing the building. It was promising to be a nice break from our winter weather back home. We spent the day exploring the local area. Louisiana's magic is hard to resist. We returned to our lodging by late afternoon and spent an hour chatting it up with the innkeeper. She was a local and gave us a little bit of history and tales of the town. Before turning in for the night, we took a stroll around the property. Something drew us towards the back and suddenly we found ourselves standing in front of a nearby swamp. The old dark water held an eerie stillness that sent a shiver down my spine. I shrugged it off, attributing it to the ghost stories that were shared earlier. We headed back to the room. It had been a long day and we were both eager to get some sleep. But when we got there, a strange smell filled the room. It was a burnt smell, but there was something sour and rotten there along with it. I asked my wife if she noticed it too, but she waved it off as an old house smell. By then, we were too exhausted from our day to dwell on it further, so we climbed into bed. A sudden noise jolted us awake. Barely an hour later, I wasn't sure what it was, either a growl or a deep screaming roar. We tried to locate the source of it, but my mind was still clouded with sleep, and I struggled to come to the realization of what was happening. We heard it again, louder this time. A crawling sense of unease took over, and we turned on the bedside lamp. My heart pounded in my chest. I almost didn't want to see what the light was going to reveal. The room, bathed in a warm halo of light, seemed different. 
the antique furniture, the faded wallpaper, the cracked mirror, everything suddenly seemed menacing. A feeling of dread pooled in my stomach as I noticed a shadow stretching from the center of the room towards our bed. My wife grabbed my arm and pointed towards the ceiling. Her face twisted in fear. It was difficult to discern at first, but the ceiling held a pattern of something dark and fluid, like wisps of smoke held in place. It was shifting and reforming, almost as if it were alive. We didn't know what was happening above us. The air became heavy, suffocating almost as a nauseous, rotten smell seemed to grow. The apparition, or whatever it was, that hung above us continued to dance around the ceiling. The shadow at the edge of the room crept closer. The roars rang out again, echoing around the room. They were clearer that time, and the worst part? They sounded like they were coming from directly beneath us. Acting on instinct, we rushed out of our room and down the creaky staircase, searching for someone to help us. When we peered down from the top of the stairs, our hearts nearly stopped. The innkeeper was standing on the ground floor, surrounded by strange symbols drawn on the floor in what looked like blood. As she chanted, the room seemed to grow darker, and a tall figure began to take shape in the center of the floor. Whatever the things we had seen in our room, this was worse. It towered over everything, horns jutted from its head and its eyes glowing a fiery red. The creature had huge wings, like those of a bat and clawed hands that curled in anticipation. I could feel my heart pounding in my throat and my wife's hands squeezing mine in terror. The air was thick now with sulfur and all of a sudden the air around us became unbearably hot. Out of pure fear, we walked back up the stairs as silently as we could. Once at the top, we bolted for our room, grabbed our stuff and got the hell out of there leaving the keys on the hallway table as we ran out of the front door. It was deep into the night, and we drove in silence, neither of us knowing what to say or feel. We kept driving until morning when the sun began to peak over the horizon. It was then that we finally felt the terror ebbing away, leaving behind a strange mixture of relief and bewilderment. For days after that encounter, we didn't dare talk about it, fearing that somehow it might just make it more real. It was only after we returned to Minnesota that we gathered the courage to discuss what we saw. Part of me hopes it was some shared hallucination brought on from a disagreeable dinner or perhaps too much to drink. I mean, how could something like that even be real? It sounds completely insane, I know, but it happened. I wouldn't have believed it either if I hadn't seen it for myself. I don't think we'll ever go back to the South for another vacation anytime soon. Well, my story isn't long. I firmly stand by what I experienced that day, back in May 1999. During this time, I was looking around scouting areas for the best turkey hunting. There's a specific area in the mountain range around me, where I know lots of wild turkeys like to congregate and come together. But to get there, you have to go through a lot of thick brush and timber. There is an old logging road that will take you a few miles up, and then from there, it's about another three miles on foot, all through thick, dense forest. Not a problem since I'm pretty much raised and born in the woods. But on this day, in May 1999, on my way to that spot in question, I was attacked by some upright canine walking on its two hind legs, and I'm still not exactly sure what it was. Luckily for me, I came out unharmed as I did not allow it to get close enough to do any real damage. I shot off a ton of rounds, but I think I only scared it off because it retreated and sounded like more were following after me. So part of me thinks that it was an ambush or some sort of trap, like they knew I was there and they were getting ready, calculating the perfect time to ambush me and take me down. I can't prove that theory, but from the noises that I heard after this thing took off, there was more of them around me, surrounding me, coming towards me. That was more than enough proof in my mind that I needed to get out of there and leave. Besides the fact that I was just attacked by some unknown canine, that I'm not sure where it came from or what it was, nor have I ever seen it in my life before. Before I jump into the actual description of the account itself, I'm going to lay this flat out. I don't normally listen to horror stories or watch horror movies. I don't believe in vampires, werewolves, monsters, zombies, ghosts. 
None of that. I like to think that real life doesn't contain any of those fictional things. But since this happened to me, I feel like my mind and the possibilities have been opened a little more. After I got out of my truck, I was parked in this old logging road. And remember, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. There's not a soul around for at least 10 miles. I can remember some of these details very well because the entire account stands so strong in my brain. I want to say, I probably wasn't even 200 yards of the trail from my truck when the entire woods around me went deathly silent. Now that only means one thing. There's a large predator in the area and all the wildlife knows it. That means no birds, no squirrels chirping and chattering. That's what I expected, which is exactly why I kept a firearm on me. My thoughts at the time were a mountain lion, and mountain lions can be known to attack people, especially given the right circumstances of them being hungry and you being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And while it wasn't exactly a mountain lion, it was something much, much worse. I still refused to lay down and die that day. I was going to hold my ground no matter what. I didn't care if it was a giant. So where I was on the trail was a very gradual incline. It probably started off at the base of the road, right where my truck is. You walk across the logging road and it's a very, very gradual incline, probably 500, 600 yards before reaching the top of a ridge. Then it's a very gradual decline and then flattens out after a while. You take this for about another couple miles and it drops down again into almost a little valley, if you want to call it that. It's a very large clearing with a small little creek. And if you follow it, which I have done before, it feeds into a larger river that runs through the entire area. So when the woods around me went deathly silent, it was instantly noticeable. I was still able to turn around from my position and clearly see my truck and also turn around from there and clearly see the top of the ridge that I was walking to. Once the woods became quiet, I became aware. Acute senses kept me alert of everything going on. I continued my pace, keeping my hand on my gun. I made it probably about another 100 yards, maybe more when I started to hear movement off to my right. At first, it sounded like something moving around like a small animal, nothing to be concerned about immediately, but it went from rustling to a thrashing sound, as if something big was throwing itself all around in the brush. And keep in mind, this was May, so everything was freshly lush and grown back from winter time. I kept my focus on the right of me, but still continuing my pace. Not exactly sure what was going on, thinking perhaps a mountain lion was about to pounce on me, but I wasn't exactly sure. Then I make it about another 60 yards and up the trail for me, probably about another 50 to 100 yards, only about another 100 yards up from the top of the ridge. If that's not confusing, out jumps this canine on its hind legs, out onto the trail. The trail, by the way, is a game trail that's been used a lot in the past. But it's pretty overgrown and worn out, leaving just enough room for me to travel through without thick, crazy brush blocking my way. I want to say there was maybe two feet of total clearance on both sides of me. And right as this thing jumps out, I'm already keeping my attention to the noises on my right. And also, keeping ahead of me, trying to be extremely alert and in tune to everything surrounding me. When this thing jumps out in front of me, it looks right at me, and that's what made me stop dead in my tracks. At this point, my hand was already on my gun and I knew instinctively, just from being out in the woods enough, that this was no natural creature, and this thing meant danger. Nothing can replicate the look that it gave me. It was in no way a look of imminent surprise. It was a look like it was telling me, you shouldn't be here and now, I'm going to make you pay. This thing probably stopped and stared at me for one minute. I don't even know if it was able to size me up in that time, but it immediately began turning into a runner stance like a runner does and starts jogging toward me on two legs, arms outreached and mouth open. As if it's going to grab me, I immediately don't even hesitate. I pull out my gun and start firing. It probably makes it within, I want to say 20 to 30 yards for me. After I've already fired several rounds and jumps off into the left side of me running 90 degrees for me. Now this thing is running like a bulldozer through the woods, screaming, the loudest horrific noise I've ever heard, and is going perpendicular away from me in the woods. Meanwhile, there's also noise still on my right, 
that's getting louder and louder, and after several more seconds goes by, and the screaming of that thing that I shot gets quieter and quieter, the noises around me began to come alive. That's when I began to hear thick thrashing from not only my right, but to my 5 o'clock, my 2 o'clock, and my 7 o'clock, all sounding like they're getting closer and closer to me. Now, I truly felt that feeling of imminent danger and that I needed to get out of there now if I wanted to live. So very calmly, I turned around, but also keeping my eyes around me 360 degrees. I quickly made my way back down the trail, the several 100 yards I'd already walked, making sure to keep pace and keep track of everything around me. The noise and the thrashing continued and followed me all the way down to the end of the game trail, where it connects to the old logging road. As I was roughly within 50 yards of the logging road and only another 20 from the truck, I began to hear that screaming sound coming back, heading right towards me from the diagonal angle in the woods. I assumed it to be the same canine bipedal creature that I had shot at just moments previously. It sounded like it was pissed and it was coming down the ridge on a diagonal, coming towards me and the truck. I knew at this point I had to double time it or there wasn't going to be any of me left. I had no idea what I was dealing with. This is some advanced, unknown, large predator. I made it back into my truck, flew in, pulled the car in gear, and drove out of there quicker than I could have. I probably drove so fast. I think I nearly bent my axle driving over some of the rocks of the old crappy logging road. I mean, after all, there were a lot of rocks that you had to be careful. Driving in, I was probably doing about 10 or 20 miles an hour. These were really large rocks. But driving out of there, I want to say I was probably doing close to 40, maybe more. Trying to preserve my life was far more important. There were points where I could hear the rocks grinding against my front axle, and I was just praying to God that it did not do any damage to my truck. Luckily, I made it down the logging road and back to one of the more main roads. I can't tell you if the noises ceased once I got in my truck. I didn't have my windows rolled down, and I was not looking back. I did not want to risk that thing bursting out of the woods, coming to pull me out of my truck and take me away. But if that's what it was doing, it had missed me by a very short amount. As far as the other noises that were going crazy in the woods near me, I'm not sure. The noise around me erupted as if these things were now signaled to come and ambush me and get closer. Even though I described to you the sounds as thrashing around and rustling, they became louder and louder, not only in volume, but in distance. I truly believe that this thing did not act alone. And as soon as this thing was shot and ran off, the other three or four that were surrounding me were beginning to move in. Had I stood there any longer or pursued the ridgeline, which is what I was originally heading for, I think they would have pounced on me and tore me limb from limb. And judging by the appearance of what I saw, this thing looked clearly like a half-man, half-wolf hybrid that looked very comfortable walking on two legs with large hands, or what appeared to be hands and long black claws at the end of each fingertip, which if I had to guess would measure anywhere between six to eight inches in length. And they were pretty thick. The hands resembled that of a raccoon hand. The chest had a large patch of fur on it. Although these creatures or the creature I saw had long fur all over its body, and the head had a huge lion's mane, except it was more resembling of a wolf and the eyes and the face were very much animalistic, except around the eyes and the brow ridge, which were more humanoid. But the few things that really stand out to me as truly disturbing, besides its facial expressions and its sheer intelligence and power and speed, were its teeth and its eyes. As soon as it opened its mouth and charged towards me, this thing had an unnatural number of teeth unlike any predator should have. I want you to think for a second. Imagine a shark, and how a shark's mouth is full of razor teeth. They're not large teeth per se, but there's a bunch of tiny ones that are razor sharp. That's kind of how this thing was. They weren't literal shark teeth, but this thing's mouth was overloaded with them. Tiny and little daggers that I could clearly see from the distance that I was. I can't even imagine how they look up close. I did not want to see that. It looked to be way too many teeth for its mouth and its eyes. Its eyes appeared to be a very soft orange that did not glow or give off any light, but they had such a fierceness to them that was almost striking just from looking at them. 
I have a cousin who's a very, very good illustrator, and I've thought many times about sitting down with him and having him illustrate what I saw that day. I'm sure he could bring it to life just going by my descriptions since the image of this thing will forever be burned in my mind. Feel free to ask me any questions. I'm happy to answer any of them. Thank you. I have a pretty strange story to share. I'm not usually one for these types of tales, but this one is real and it rattled me up good. A few springs back, I was out here on the farm, just outside of Raymond, a little old town in the Midwest. Now, I'm a simple man, a farmer, and I've got this precious piece of land that's been in my family for generations. My day-to-day -day life isn't all that exciting, not that I'm complaining. There's a certain peace to be found in the routine. Up before dawn, chores all day. In by sundown, rinse and repeat. That day was just like any other. I checked on the livestock, mended a part of the fence that had seen better days, and spent the better part of the morning tending to the fields, planning, plowing, planting. That's my life when the growing season comes. And you know what they say, the secret to a good harvest is starting early. Every day, I stroll through each field before dawn, coffee in hand, taking in the crisp morning air and preparing myself for another day of hard work. There's this brief moment, just as the sun starts to peek over the horizon, where everything feels peaceful and still. It's at moments like these that I really appreciate how much I love this land. It's hard work, sure, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. About mid-morning, I found myself out near the old oak tree, the massive one that stood at the edge of our property for as long as anyone can remember. I had my earphones in, a bit of Johnny Cash to keep me company, and I was all set to start spreading the last of the mulch around the foot of the tree. The sun was high in the sky by then, casting long, sprawling shadows. It was just like any other day, but something felt off. You know that prickling sensation you get when you feel like you're being watched? Couldn't shake that. I've spent my life learning the rhythms of the land, the ebb and flow of the seasons, the songs the birds sing at different times of day, the way the shadows stretch across the fields as the sun travels across the sky. You learn these things and you start to feel a connection to the place. You start to sense when things are as they should be and when they're not, but even to my own surprise, I shrugged off that feeling and got back to work. I'd kept on with my work and all but forgotten about that strange sensation. With Ring of Fire playing to my rhythmic shoveling, all was right with the world again. Now, here's where things start to get mighty strange. As I was wrapping up my work around lunchtime, I noticed something out of the ordinary in the far off wheat field. There were markings of some sort that hadn't been there just the day before. Squinting against the sun, I couldn't quite make out the details. Real peculiar. Seeing those unexpected changes in my well-tended plot. So I decided to go take a closer look. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like those stories you'd heard of crop circles over in Britain. But this was in my little corner of the Midwest. Sound as mad as a hatter, I know. But there it was. Plain as day. The markings were intricate almost akin to some sort of extraterrestrial blueprint, spirals extending from a central point forming a complex pattern that looked like something da Vinci might have dreamt up. Each twist and turn was cut into the wheat perfectly. There was not a stalk out of place. And the sheer scale of it, it was covering a patch the size of a football field, possibly bigger. I was so engrossed stepping gingerly along the edge of the formation, taking in the otherworldly artistry of whatever this was. Time somehow seemed to distort, each minute stretching out longer than the last. I could hardly hear much over the beating of my heart. By the time I snapped back, I noticed the sun was already beginning to dip near the horizon. I couldn't wrap my head around how long I'd been out there. A sense of cold dread washed over me, and I realized I had to get out of that field and back to the farmhouse. It's a funny thing what happens when you get rattled. You try and put it all out of your mind. Focus on the simple things that need to get done. Feed the livestock, mend the fences, and weed the fields, hoping normal bleeds back into life. But even as I tried to keep to my routine, I couldn't shake off that uncanny feeling. Every so often, 
I'd catch myself looking back out towards the fields, skin crawling with tingles. Over the next few days, that carved out piece of the field became the elephant in my living room. I thought about roping off the area and calling in the experts, but stories of supposed UFO sightings and conspiracies about men in black swirled in my head. Unable to explain it, I'm now left with nothing but curiosity and unease. An ominous sign unveiled in the lush wheat fields, marking out a message I couldn't decipher, marring the quiet idol of my farm. Each day it sits there as a reminder of something unknowable, unnatural out there in the world. Now every sundown fills me less with peace and a sense of dread creeps in. I'm left grappling, hoping for an answer, some semblance of sanity in all this. But for now, the markings remain, a cryptic message from another realm. I'm not sure what's out there. Thinking about it makes the hair at the back of my neck stand up and takes the good night's sleep right away. Whatever its purpose, it was my proof that something more is out there. I've got a story you might be interested in. This happened to me a couple years back. It was early springtime in our small Arizona town. I was a college kid, just graduated, and entirely unsure of what's next. I was staying with my cousins for the summer until I figured something else out. The old house had a charm of its own. There was a lot of history there, but that's not what I'm writing in about. That's a whole nother story. Let me paint you a picture of life in Arizona. It's not all husky cowboy romance with the wind rustling through long dried grass. It's long hot days that turn you into a creature with the speed and ambition of a slug. It was impossible to do anything outdoors after about 10 a.m. The sunrises and sunsets around here were pretty killer though. It was like an artist painted them across the sky every night. My days were mostly uneventful. I'd help my cousin with the house chores, bum around town, or just go for long walks and admire the landscape. I was living a quiet life. It gave me the time I needed to think about my next phase of life. But then things started to get strange. I would take walks around the property just about every night at dusk. It became a sort of ritual for me. Also, it was the only time of day I could go for a walk without melting into a puddle on the ground. On one of my walks, I noticed this strange figure lurking on the horizon line. At first, I thought maybe I was just hallucinating it. Maybe I had been out in the heat too long. But then I saw it again the next night, and there was more than just the one. They looked like birds from a distance. Large birds, but birds nonetheless. We had eagles, vultures, and condors out here, so I didn't think too much of it. The first good look I got of the creature was something I would never forget. The sun had just sunk past the horizon, leaving streaks of orange that melded into a bluish purple. I remember thinking that Arizona must have the best sunsets in the world. I was watering the people tree near the edge of the property. It had been drier than usual that week, and I figured the tree could use all the help it could get. Suddenly, an ominous shadow flickered across the sky, like something large had passed over the sun. I looked up from the water can in time to catch a hint of a large figure disappearing behind a rocky outcrop beyond the property. Whatever it was, it was big. I scanned the horizon, but everything was silent except. I went back to my business with the tree, and when I went to turn around, the creature was sitting out in the open, watching me. It was this strange reptilian figure with large gangly limbs. Large black talons extended from its hands and feet. It had wings like a bird, feathers included. However, its body was covered entirely in scales, except for the end of the tail, which had a plume of feathers attached to it. The creature was the color of the sand and stones around it. If I hadn't seen it move, I might not have even noticed it was there. It was near perfect camouflage, except for the eyes. It had these yellow snake-like predatory eyes. That was the only one I saw up close, but I ran into others during my summer there. Sometimes there would be only one out, but more often than not, there were three or four dotted around the landscape. To find them, you really had to look. I didn't understand why they were there, then seemed intent on watching me whenever I came out into the yard in the evening. My cousins had lived at that house for ages, and never once had they mentioned anything remotely close to this. 
I didn't know what they were. Maybe some new bird species? But to me, they looked like dinosaurs. I know that sounds crazy, but they were covered in scales and had distinctly lizard-like heads. I don't have any other theories that make a bit of sense. Maybe the Arizona desert held secrets deeper than we'd like to think. But this was all speculation on my end. No hard evidence. I decided one day that I would take a camera out there with me. I had been seeing them just about every night, so I had a good chance of catching a photograph. I took my evening walk, and when I got to the edge of the property, I could see one of them sitting on a rock formation. Despite my better judgment, I decided to approach the creature. It didn't take its eyes off me as I slowly made my way towards it. All I wanted was a photo. That was it. I just wanted some definite proof that I wasn't insane. But then, just as I got within range, the creature took flight and swooped over my head like it was dive bombing me. I instinctively covered my head, but it flew off without contact. I didn't see the creatures again for nearly two weeks. I don't know how to say this without sounding weird, but I felt bad that I disturbed the creature, that I upset it when it wasn't doing anything at all to me. They finally began to return to their regular places and let them be. It was a strange dynamic, but they didn't seem to want to hurt anyone, so I figured we could just exist together as we were. After all, the desert is big enough for all of us. It happened a few months ago when I decided to explore the infamous Packard plant in Detroit, Michigan. It's an old automobile factory that's been sitting in ruins since the 1950s. It was a big deal back in the day. It's where the Packard Motor Car Company used to churn out luxury automobiles for the upper class. I've always been a bit of a history buff, and forgotten places like this were fascinating to me. And I suppose I was looking for a bit of adventure too. So I decided to go exploring and see what I could find. I started my day with a massive thermos of coffee, my camera, and my headlamp. Now, I'm no fool. I've explored abandoned buildings before. These places have little to no indoor lighting, and they can be dangerous if you're not careful. Rusted machinery, crumbling floors, unstable roofs, that type of thing. This plant, over a million square feet of crumbing industrial decay, is an urban explorer's dream, or nightmare depending on how you look at it. I made my entrance through the remnants of one of the front doorways, which was now just a gaping hole in the side of the wall. Everywhere I looked, it was a cathedral of rust and graffiti. Once upon a time, Detroit was the heart of American industry. It's a little surprising to me that this building was allowed to fall into such decay, given its history. Slivers of daylight spill through the broken windows, giving the place an eerie glow. The lighting wasn't too terrible just inside, but it got darker and darker the deeper I went into the structure. The silence was heavy, almost tangible. Through the course of the day, I worked my way through the labyrinth of hallways, photographing the structure. You might be surprised to know that exploring abandoned buildings has become a pretty popular hobby for photographers. You can get some real neat shots in a place like this, where nature has started to creep indoors, and reclaim things for the earth. As I explore, I'm aware of every creak, every whisper of wind through the broken windows. This kind of environment has a way of making your senses sharp. Out of nowhere, the atmosphere changed. The air grew heavy all of a sudden, and with it came an unnatural smell. It was damp and musty, almost gamey, not something I would expect in a place like this. I had this sudden urge to run, to flee the factory, but... My curiosity kept me where I stood. I should have listened to that voice in my head. It knew something I didn't. It was a moment before I discovered what was responsible for the fear I was feeling. At first, it was just an outline. A shadow far down one of the gloomy hallways. It looked like the outline of a man, but then it was gone. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I was just seeing things. I told myself that it was probably just my imagination, and I continued on my way. I didn't get far before I saw it again. I was surprised at how quiet it moved. No footsteps, no rustling, nothing. It was damn near silent. This time, I thought it was maybe a ghost. The figure was dark, and I couldn't make out any details. I had my flashlight pointed towards the floor, afraid of what I would see if I shined the beam towards the figure. 
My curiosity got the best of me when I noticed what looked like pointed ears coming out of the figure's head. They were like cat's ears, or so I had thought. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw when I raised my light. The creature standing before me was covered in long gray hair, or fur, really. It was standing upright like a man, and had the arms and torso of one. Its legs, however, were something else entirely. From the thighs to the knees, it looked human but further down. Its legs were hawked like a dog's. Its feet were clawed and dog-like as well. It looked like it had hands, but it was difficult to tell from the position it was in. The face, though, that was the worst part. Its head was that of a wolf. There was nothing human about it at all. Its eyes reflected back at me like a wild animal. I was dumbfounded. It looked like a creature straight out of a science fiction film. This couldn't be real, I told myself. There was no way. I stood there staring at it like a deer in headlights. But then the creature moved. It dropped down to four legs and started walking towards me. It wasn't running or leaping or anything. Just walking. Somehow that was even more terrifying. I don't know how long I stood there staring at it like an idiot. Before my survival instincts kicked in and I ran. I ran faster than I thought possible. I ran all the way back through the factory afraid to look behind me and see that beast chasing me down. I kept running until I reached my car. I remember looking back at the factory, just waiting for the creature to make an appearance in one of the doorways or broken windows, but it didn't. In fact, I don't even think it chased me at all. Let's be honest, there is no way I could have outrun that thing if it had wanted to stop me. I'm not sure why it let me go, or for that matter, what it even was. The only thing I know for certain is that you won't catch me out exploring alone anymore. Not after seeing that. There are so many things in this world that are unknown. If you're an adventurer like I am, you better keep your eyes out for the things that might be lurking in the shadows. I had just started work as a police officer. I was new and it takes a while for the other officers to start to have faith in us newbies. So when I think back on this event, I sometimes wonder if I was in over my head. I never really told the truth about what had happened, and neither did my partner at the time whose name was Jeff. We didn't think we'd be believed. I hadn't earned my respect yet on the force, and my partner only had me as a witness to what happened. Do you think anyone would believe us? Absolutely not. If anything, my being there would have just made everyone more skeptical about our encounter. I wouldn't say that we covered it up. I would say that we didn't report what happened because we didn't fully believe what we had seen. What would you do in a situation like that? Probably the same as we did. I'm a little nervous to explain how things transpired. It's been so long and I've never uttered a word about it since that night. But here goes. It was Halloween night. I was on duty and most officers hated Halloween night because of all the mischief and drinking. Plus, the department saw Halloween night as a reason for people to create things in their mind, to let imaginations run amok and get themselves all riled up. So, of course, they sent the lower ranking officers to deal with the situation. Jeff had been in the department for a longer time than I had but hadn't moved up much. From what I was told, he had some trouble with drinking in the past. But from what I could see, he was very committed to the job, but also very worried about ruining his reputation further, so he tended to stick by the books. That night, we had been called out for several things. Firstly, for some rowdy teens who had been lighting trash cans on fire. Then there were a few bar fights. You know, stuff like that. Eventually, there was a call for loitering. Apparently, several people had called and stated that there was a strange man in a light-colored costume walking around one of the city's main streets. Many of the calls reported that the character hadn't done anything, but that it was very close to a residential area with kids, and that the person seemed a bit menacing. Probably just an odd bird, but with being near kids, I could understand the concerning nature of this. We were driving to the location, and the area was pretty dark. There were lots of trees, and even though it was near a residential neighborhood, this particular area looked very unkempt and far from any houses. Really, it reminded me of this wooded area from my hometown where kids would sneak off to party. So I had it in my mind that we were looking for a drunk kid in costume. That seemed plausible, or even a homeless man wandering around. 
Nothing seemed too unusual about it at first. Eventually, we get to an area with a concrete tunnel. I suppose bridge would be the correct term for it, as it was apparent that the tunnel acted more as an archway over a stream. At the top of this arched bridge was a looming figure, in a light-colored outfit of some sort, obviously the person that people had been calling in about. I couldn't see the face because we were still quite a distance away from the individual, but I could tell it was most likely a man. They appeared to be wearing some type of jumpsuit that was very pale in color, and something on his head. Now, this could have been a hat, a mask, a hood. Really, I'm not sure what it was at this point. We didn't want the individual to make a run for it. So, we parked where we were, climbed out of the vehicle, and proceeded towards the bridge. The air was very cold, and it felt very dense and heavy. I wouldn't have admitted it then, but the hairs on my neck stood up straight, and I just felt a sense of tension. As we got closer to the bridge, the individual looked more like a silhouette. We no longer had the benefit of our headlights to light up the bridge, so I tried my flashlight. Strangely, it didn't work. Jeff tried his flashlight. Same situation. It wouldn't turn on. Jeff then calls out to the guy. Hello, sir. How's your night going? We were really thinking that the man would be intoxicated, so we were expecting some slurred response, but nothing. We were nearly at the base of the tunnel, so we were puzzled that the individual wasn't responsive. This can be an alarming situation because we can assess what state the individual is in. Did they need help? Could they not speak? We aren't sure about any of their circumstances, so we had to be prepared for anything. Sir, what are you doing out here? This is a residential area. Do you live here? I looked up at the shadow. I still couldn't tell what the man was wearing, but it did seem like it was weathered and dingy. Sir, if you aren't going to respond to our questions, we will have to come up there with you. Still no response. Jeff looked at me and I looked at him. He then nodded, meaning that we needed to approach the man and get closer. So my partner goes to the left of the bridge and I go to the right. We had to climb up a hill on both sides to get to the top area of the bridge in order to come at him from opposite directions. The hill was a bit damp. The night had been humid and foggy. So it was a bit slick. By the time we reached the top, my partner and I were looking at each other from across the bridge. The man was no longer there, no longer on the bridge. He had basically vanished. We approached the area where the man had been standing. We started looking for traces of anything that would tell us he was there, but there was nothing. Where could the guy have gone? The bridge was high and jumping off wasn't exactly an option. Besides, there was no noise, no splash, no scream, nothing. My partner, Jeff, was now on the other side of the bridge, shining his flashlight here and there, his face twisted in confusion. I could see his breath in the cold, humid air. We both knew something wasn't right. We met again at the center of the bridge, looking down into the water below, but there was nothing to see, no sign of any person. We were baffled. I don't like this. Jeff said with his voice just above a whisper. This isn't normal. You're telling me, I replied, feeling a chill that wasn't from the night air. Maybe he climbed down somehow, or maybe there's a path we didn't see. We looked around some more, but there were no signs of any path, no signs of anyone climbing down. Everything was still, and the fog was starting to roll in, making everything feel even eerier. Eventually, we decided to head back to the car. What else could we do? We had to report it, but what were we going to say? That a man had just vanished into thin air. As we were climbing down the hill, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I kept looking over my shoulder, but there was nothing there. Just fog, shadows, and that damp, earthy smell of the night. We got into the car, and Jeff was quiet. I could see he was shaken. I was too, but I didn't want to admit it. We'd been through a lot together, but this was different. This wasn't something we could explain away or laugh off later. We drove back to the station in silence, each lost in our thoughts. We made our report, but like I said earlier, we did tell the truth as we experienced it. We just said we couldn't find the person people had called in about. The chief just shook his head and told us to get some rest. That night, neither Jeff nor I could sleep. We kept going over it in our heads, trying to figure out what had happened. But there were no answers, 
no logical explanations. And you know what the craziest part is? A few days later, another call came in. Same bridge, same description of the man. But this time, when the officers arrived, the man was gone again. We never did find out what was going on up on that bridge. And to this day, I avoid it whenever I can. I know it sounds crazy, but I can't shake the feeling that something otherworldly was going on there. Jeff feels the same way. It's become a story we share with new recruits, a kind of initiation. They never know whether to believe us or not, but I tell you, it's the God's honest truth. That Halloween night on the bridge changed something in both of us. We saw something we can't explain, and it's stuck with us ever since. That's the job, I guess. You never know what you're going to encounter, but that night, that was something else. It's a night neither of us will ever forget. I've got a different spin on things for you today. I'm a night shift radio host out of Nevada. I run this Creatures of the Night segment where I get calls from folks sharing their out of this world experiences. More often than not, my callers are folks who swear they've been up close and personal with beings from other planets, alien abductions. To be honest, I was always a bit of a skeptic. I didn't much believe the stories, but there's no denying they're entertaining as hell. But all of a sudden, the calls started getting more frequent, more detailed, and the people on the other end of the line were either real good actors or they were truly frightened. I wasn't sure if there was something in the water, or maybe there was some truth to the stories after all. It was just another night on air for me, clutching a lukewarm coffee and shooting the breeze with my listeners. Tonight was a full moon, and it seemed like a magnet for crazy callers. I was looking forward to hearing some exciting new tales real or not. Most nights are a blur of tall tales and urban legends. Some were goofy while others downright chilling. But as the night fell, an uncomfortable sensation washed over me. I couldn't quite place it, but I had a feeling that this wouldn't be any old ordinary night. Having second thoughts about this creature encounters segment was nothing new. Every now and then, when folks started talking about gray figures hovering above their beds, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. It's the job, I'd tell myself, brushing off the eerie feeling. But tonight, the shadows in the studio seemed to contain something I couldn't shake off. As usual, the phone lines were jammed. Callers dialed in, eagerly sharing their run-ins with the unknown, each tale overtaking the previous one in bizarreness. Some reported strange lights in the sky over the desert. Others spoke of lost time episodes or weird dreams that left a physical mark on their bodies. I laughed it off as I usually did, but tonight, their stories were giving me goosebumps. Before long, the show took a weird turn. There was a sudden surge in the number of callers, claiming to have encountered the greys. Those are the little aliens with the big bobbleheads. Now I could maybe wrap my mind around Bigfoot, or those shape-shifting witches out in the desert, but I'll admit, I had a hard time believing in aliens. One female listener, Janice calling in from Elko, shared a particularly disturbing close encounter that night. She spoke in a chilling, hushed tone, sharing her traumatic experience of a night visit from these so-called greys. Janice's tale was one for the books. Besides the details she shared with a quivering voice, something else hung in the silence between her words. An insidious unease that didn't belong in my usually jolly late-night entertainment show. As the night became eerily silent, the studio seemed like it held an electrical charge, just waiting for something unsettling to break loose. I felt a sudden rush of dread that had no explanation. It was absolutely insane. A chill shot down my back and I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. It was so loud that I wouldn't be surprised if the mics picked it up. And yet, there was no reason for it. Nothing was happening. I couldn't shake the feeling, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. I was on the clock. Picking up another call, I braced myself for one more tale before calling it a night. But for all my skepticisms and bravado, nothing could have prepared me for what was coming next. My regular broadcast was interrupted by a series of bizarre signals. An onslaught of high-pitched beeps, followed by squelching static, began to drown out my steady voice, making it impossible for my listeners to hear me. 
The dials and frequencies on the control panel danced wildly, and the lights dimmed. Of course, I thought. It's the paranormal show that goes on the fritz after dark. I tried to laugh it off internally, but I knew there was something else at work. My earlier sense of high-spirited adventure was replaced by a heavy lump in my throat. This wasn't the day-to-day -day technical hiccup one might expect with an older radio station. My signal had been hijacked from some untraceable and unknown source. All around me, the once familiar equipment buzzed and flickered, as if possessed. I searched around the room for anything out of place that I might be able to fix. Two of the techs came in to help, but they couldn't seem to find the problem either. And then I started to think, was it a simple malfunction, or was something otherworldly at play here? Could it be that my callers were not so crazy after all? Things suddenly settled down out of nowhere, and I got back on the air. The techs didn't know what happened, but we were back online. So I continued my show and picked up another caller, and yet another story of the infamous Greys. And then the same thing happened. The studio room went haywire once again, and I had no choice to call it and bid my listeners farewell for the night. But even as the broadcast ended, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't quite right. As the darkness of the night enveloped the studio, I sat there alone, replaying the night's bizarre happenings. I mulled over each of my listeners' chilling tales of the greys. Suddenly, their stories didn't sound so far-fetched. I continued on with the show and a strange pattern emerged. Whenever someone would call in about the greys, they would be cut off by what the studio can only describe as technical difficulties. It was the same ordeal. All of the systems would glitch at the same time and prevent the callers from telling their stories. This didn't happen with tales of other creatures. They all got through just fine. Now I'm not saying aliens are real, but there is something out there listening to my late night show, and it doesn't want anyone talking about the greys. Take from that as you will.